From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. A new law passed by the legislature and signed by Governor Lincoln Chafee has opened the door for state-subsidized child care workers to unionize. But it's not a done deal. Those workers still need to vote on whether to join a union. One conservative group is trying to convince them they're better off without. Our guest on the first half of Newsmakers, CEO of the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity, Mike Stenhouse. Then... A new Brown University poll looks like good news for Treasurer Gina Raimondo's gubernatorial hopes, putting her eight points ahead of fellow Democrat Angel Tavares. But the Tavares campaign is standing by their own survey that shows the Providence mayor has a double-digit lead. Who's right? Our guest on the second half of Newsmakers, Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and political reporter for Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. And uh, gentlemen, before we get going, I want to mention that uh, we invited members of labor to join us on the program, including the head of the SEIU, Local 1199. Patrick Quinn declined to come on the show until after the vote, which will decide if child care workers are going to unionize. Now, Kathy Gregg of the Providence Journal reporting this morning that the vote will take place on October 26. We also invited the lawmakers who sponsored the bill that allowed this process to happen. They also declined to, uh, declined to come on. Now, Mike, I get it. I know why the union uh, decided uh, not to join us on the program. They don't see an advantage to it uh, uh, to come on the show with a vote just around the corner. Of course, it doesn't mean that we're not going to tackle the subject just because someone doesn't want to come on. We do appreciate you joining us on the show. We did, however, go into our archives to get the voice of labor on the show. George Nee, the head of the powerful AFL-CIO of Rhode Island, was on Ted Show Executive Suite last month, and he was asked about this very topic. So let's take a listen to what he had to say, and I want your response. Here's George Nee. Well, here's, here's the situation. You have to go back to what is the fundamental reason why people form unions. It's to gain a a voice on the job. It's to gain some control over their wages, their benefits, and their working conditions. All they're, all, all they're really doing is, again, through a democratic process, through an election, secret ballot election, they are going to decide themselves. They haven't made that decision yet. They've petitioned for an election. They will have a vote whether or not they want to form an organization, a union, to improve their wages, their benefits, their working conditions. All right, Mike, again, that was George Nee and Ted Show Executive Suite talking about this uh, child care vote, which we now know, again, is coming on October 26. It will take place over several days. Why is George wrong? Why shouldn't they have a right to try and better uh, their lives, have higher wages, and at least have the choice to unionize? A lot of reasons. Um, let's just first understand what this is all about. The unions nationally see declining membership. In that same interview, Mr. Nee mentioned they want more political power, more legislative influence. The only way they do that is through money. They see money going from the state on behalf of low-income families to these child care providers, independent business owners, not employees of the state. And they say, how can we get some of that money to increase our influence? And this is all that this is about. So let's just understand that as a backdrop. Okay, why it's not good. First of all, in most states, and we issued a report on this, rifreedom.org, most states where they've unionized Unions were not able to fulfill their promises. They weren't able to obtain any benefits on behalf of union, uh, the, the new union members. They don't get increases in subsidies, uh, child care subsidies in most cases. They don't get health benefits in most cases. The number of child care providers fed up with all this actually goes down. The number of children served actually goes down in these union, most of these unionized states. So the only guaranteed winner in all of this is the SEIU and the unions because they'll now be collecting dues and fees. And if they do negotiate benefits, the taxpayers, all of us, pay that bill. So you are saying that if they vote to pass to join a union, these workers aren't going to see an increase in pay at all? They, they might actually see a decrease and might even lose work? If you look at what's happened in other states, that's the trend. Think of the process that has to go through. First of all, the union would have to negotiate on behalf of the providers. Any, any benefit increases, health care, pensions, they say pensions aren't included, increased subsidy rates, would have to then be funded through a special bill in the General Assembly. 
Now think of our state's budget deficit. Do we really think we can take on more costs, more expense, more taxes just to pay so that some of that can go into the union's pocket? Is that really what taxpayers want? Well, you're saying going into the union's pocket. Do you seriously have a cell phone on during the taping of this show? <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, for when, when I look at this, many of the people, according to the journal, that take these jobs as child care workers are below the poverty line. Why wouldn't you want them to unionize, to have the chance at least to better their pay, negotiate benefits, and hopefully get them out of welfare eligibility in the first place? It's not a question of us wanting to unionize. It's a question of, of, of are they being prom sold a bill of goods, and are they really having their voice heard? Uh, Mr. Nee mentioned that there's an election. What could be more democratic than that? But think of the way the election is structured. There's 680 of these providers. If only 50 show up to vote, because only the people that show up to vote count, and 26 vote yes, all the other 630 will become unionized or forced to pay a fee if they collect public assistance clients. So it is not a true de democratic well, well, How is that different than a primary when only 23% of the electorate shows up to vote and that's who is going to be the nominee for that party? Right. And, Mike, and Mike, we live sure. in the age of the internet where it's very easy to get information online. Your center mm -hmm. has aggressively been devoting a lot of attention to this mm -hmm. issue. Are you arguing that these child care workers are so easily misled that they're going to vote against their own self-interest? No, what we're arguing, and, and this is the whole role of our center in this state, for too long there's only been one side of the debate. Your, your, uh, your cohort, Scott, knows that. We had a good debate yesterday on, in the paper. Uh, and they need to hear the other side of the debate. The unions are saying this. History and the other states show this. They should be made aware of that. So we would argue that if you look at the track record, that it's probably not in their best interest to be forced to pay dues when receiving any benefit is, is simply a matter of question and not likely to happen if you look at the trends. So we're just providing the other side of the debate. Isn't there sort of a... a I don't know, almost a discrepancy in your argument, because I know the center fought hard against the bill, because people should know a law, as Tim said, passed that allowed this whole process to even happen. And I know the center fought against this idea that they could have the election and vote to, to unionize. But on the other hand, now you're saying they won't get much, the people, if they vote to do so, won't get much out of it. So it seems like both of those can't be true. Like, even either the taxpayers, if the taxpayers are going to pay more, that means some more money will probably go to these child care workers. Or if the child care workers aren't going to get anything out of it, why does it matter if they do this at all? Well, because now you're, for, you're forcing, well, there's two reasons that. You're forcing this small group of people who didn't vote to become unionized and have an exclusive representative. The larger issue in this whole thing is also what Mr. Nee said. When he said this is going to be only the first of many instances like this that you're going to see. Because we know nationally they're not going to just stop with these home child care providers. Next come home health care workers. Next come the child daycare centers, the larger centers. Next come doctors, dentists food retailers, anybody that takes state money on behalf of low-income families by their theory could be next to become unionized by a process that is not at all transparent, I well, might add. One group that has a very powerful union is Major League Baseball players. You were represented by yeah. that union when you played for the Boston Red Sox. Mm -hmm. Is it your argument that it's only in the interest of union members to join a union when that union is getting good benefits for them? And if not, how do you reconcile uh, your being a, a former member of the Players Association or perhaps still a member and your opposition to the unionization of the child care workers? Yeah, very, very two major differences there. First of all, I got into the business knowing that I would become a member of that players' union. These child care providers, all, every one of them, started off just to be a simple at-home independent business owner. None of them had any thought of being a union, union member when they started their business. Second of all, benefits paid to me, which I didn't earn a lot of, but benefits paid to me are funded through corporations' private dollars. Benefits paid to ticket sales, uh, ticket digital, sales, corporate revenues, right, all that. No public money involved there. No taxpayer dollars. Here, we're asking taxpayers to foot the bill for any benefits. So it's very, you know, that's the difference between public unions and private unions. What we're talking about here is a form of so public, you're okay public with, employment. So you're okay with private unions, not public. I, you know, to, to Ian's question, let's get to your philosophy on this. Sure. Are you in the mindset that unions should be wiped off the face of the planet? No. But a public union should be? Public unions pose big problems. I, I think, um, you know, it's one thing to organize on behalf of benefits. It's another thing, as Mr. Neek, because he stated what his purpose was. We want more political and legislative power. We don't believe public unions should be controlling the legislative agenda up on Smith Hill. 
and they do. He denied it in his interview, but they do. We all know that they do. They, they, they are allied with the progressive left. And, and who can argue that those policies that have been pushed forward in this state for the last two decades have been not been harmful to our state? They'll also point out they've lost some pretty key battles up on Smith Hill. I mean, can you deny that? They're, they're, oh, no, they, they're, they're, they're trying to raise the income tax even further. Fortunately, enough people up there have enough uh, common sense not, not to go all the way with their agenda, but, but certainly it is the union progressive left agenda that, agenda that dominates our state. Nobody can argue with that. Um, we're focusing a lot on the, the unionization, understandably, but if, let's say, one of these child care workers came to you, to your center, and said, all right, I'm, you've convinced me I'm not sure the union's a good idea. What should I do to try to, yeah. to, try to raise my wages, to try, to try to make a better living off of, this, off of this business I'm in? And that's a great question, because they do have alternatives. Uh, the unions don't have to be their exclusive voice. And remember, they will, they, SEIU would become their exclusive representative. Through the normal legislative process, every, every citizen in this state as an elected official who represents them. So just like me, you, or them, they can go to the representatives that I'd like to petition you on behalf of whatever. They also have a state trade association, child care, I don't recall the name, but there is a child care association who could speak out on their behalf. Many, many independent business owners have an association that speaks on their behalf. So you do not need to be unionized. Do you think it's worked out have for a them voice. so far? Well, I don't know. Uh, we haven't look, looked at enough, enough at what that trade association I mean, come, has, these, has done. These workers aren't banking a ton of money, Mike. I mean, how? Well, it's not a question of banking money. The Providence Journal did show how many of them are earning fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. But, but they also pointed out in that yeah. article that, that a lot of them are were welfare. working, they, and they're also working around the clock. You know. But again, it's dubious whether they will ever receive a benefit. The only guarantee here, again, is that SEIU will get dupes. That's the only guaranteed winner in this whole thing. Now, what's the center? Does the center think the current reimbursement rate is the correct amount that we're paying? You know, forget that for pretend the union bill didn't pass. Does the center think we're paying the right amount right now to these people? Uh, we haven't looked at that. I, I don't have a comment on that. Mike, the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce did a study in 2003 that found that every dollar spent on child care returns $1.75 to the economy. The chamber is hardly a left wing organization. What, what's your reaction to that finding? Well, we disagree with that whole concept that you see many organizations talk about how welfare, you know, welfare payments of any kind, transfer payments, whatever you want to call them, redistribution uh, result, because you have to take that out of the economy first before you can give it to somebody but else. So, so person A could spend it just as much as person B could spend it. So we, we in theory, disagree with that but whole But there are a lot philosophy. of studies about the value of investing in children when they're young, early mm -hmm. childhood education, mm -hmm. child care. Is that not a good investment? Can be. I can't comment on this case specifically whether whether this form of uh, public assistance has returned dividends. We haven't we haven't looked at that. Mike, Mike we have to go to a break, and I, this is way off topic, and I hope you don't mind. But you are a former Red Sox <laughs> player, and we're going to the American League Championship Series. Uh, how are you feeling about the Red Sox chances against Detroit? Well, it's an exciting time, it isn't it? The year I was on the team, you know, we didn't win the World Series. It wasn't until after I left that I started winning World Series. So that tells but you. But you how taught much. them what they needed. Well, you yeah, know, right, right. <laughs> right, you no, loosened the cap on the jaw. Uh, exciting time for Red Sox. Vaccination. Um, I'll be tuned in. I'll have my popcorn ready. You're not and all answering that. the question. Yeah, Are you predicting a win for the Boston Red Sox? Uh, Red Sox Dodgers. I'm predicting, and I think it's going to be a great seven-game series. Of course, we got to predict the Red Sox will take it home. All right, Mike uh, Stenhouse, CEO of the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Thanks for joining us. And Thank again, we did invite Labor and the bill sponsors on this, and they declined to join us. When we come back, polls and politics. Our guest, Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com's Ted Nisi, and from Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. And we're joined by Eyewitness News political analyst and pollster Joe Fleming. Joe, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Uh, the reason we're here is not to talk about your poll, nope. but another poll, or at least a starting point, uh, released by Brown University this week. It showed that General Treasurer Gina Raimondo had an eight-point lead mm -hmm. over Providence Mayor Angel Tavares in a potential primary matchup. Of course, they haven't announced yet. Right. So. Uh, this is early, but um, I guess my first question is, what did you make of the poll? Well, the first thing I think we've got to look at the poll is, it, as you said, Tim, it's very early in the season. The voters right now are not focused in on who they're voting for in 2014. They're more concerned We're here with to change that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're more concerned with Columbus Day weekend, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Right. They're not zeroing in on that. So what you're seeing now is basically base support for these candidates. People who are out there saying, oh, yeah, I know Gina, I know Angel, I know Alan Fung. 
I want to support that person. But again, I have to believe a lot of this is weak support at this time due to the fact that the campaign hasn't started. The only one who was announced for governor is uh, Ken Block. So we don't know who all the candidates are. So as the campaign develops, this all can change. It's early numbers in the survey. Right now for a primary, Gina looks to be in a nice position ahead of Angel based on the Brown University survey. Uh, but again, there's one out of four voters undecided. That's a huge block of voters. We don't know the demographics of those voters and how they're going to vote and what the makeup of those voters are. Uh, Ted, you had a great Q&A with Professor Marion Orr at Brown University, and it's online, WPRI.com if you missed it. Uh, now, Marion Orr, of course, uh, spearheaded the survey on this. Um, what did you come away with from that? Uh, Q &A. Well, it was interesting. Brown is predicting a very different Democratic primary electorate than what we've seen in the past. Um, Marion Orr's poll, first of all, uh, he told me uh, the way he described it, he's thinking two-thirds of all registered voters in Rhode Island will take part in next year's election because it's they took out of the sample of all registered voters that two-thirds of them say they're going to vote in the Democratic primary. That would be a huge increase. Yeah, what does history show In the past, I, I looked up in the big uh, Mirth York, Sheldon Whitehouse, Anthony Pyrus race in 02, about 20 three percent of all registered. Wow. So Brown's thinking it'll go from 23 to 67. And then who's in the electorate? The other thing Brown is predicting is that the Democratic primary electorate will now be only 40 percent Democrats next year. In 2010, according to uh, Lake Research Partners in Washington, it was 74 percent yeah. Democrats. So, yeah. you know, the, the one of the biggest questions is, will the Democratic primary electorate look as different as Brown is thinking it will next year as this poll shows? So, yeah. and, and who does that favor then? Bigger turnout and uh, fewer Democrats. That would definitely favor, G favor Gina Raimondo. If the makeup of the primary is what Brown University shows, Gina it would be in great shape because there's more independents voted than Democratic voters. I have never seen that in all the years I've been polling in the state of Rhode Island in a Democratic primary. If Brown's right, Gina is in great shape in a Democratic primary. But if the Democratic number changes, that would favor Angel Tavares. And that goes back to what's important about Joe's point, which is it's so early that it's, you know, it, we're going to need to see a lot of um, activity, a lot of work, especially right. by the Raimondo campaign, the potential Raimondo campaign, to bring up turnout in a Democratic primary to 67% of registered voters and mm -hmm. to drive down the Democratic share of the electorate that low. And yet they're predicting more independence than Democrats in a Democratic primary, which is, again, just not, not what you usually see. And Gina Raimondo has a lot of work ahead of her to make this a reality. Yeah. It's easy for people who don't follow politics closely to forget that most voters in Rhode Island are independents, but I agree with everything that Joe and Ted have said, that the challenge for Raimondo is to get more independents into mm -hmm. the primary. That could be an uphill battle. One, even, with, even with some questions about the methodology in the Brown poll, one of my takeaways is how Angel Tavares still is the best approved public official in Rhode Island. His approval rating was about 10 points higher than Gina Raimondo, and I think that reinforces something that most of us expect, that she will use her ample war chest to try and run a lot of negative ads attacking Tavares on issues like crime and providence, budget assumptions, things like that. And that was actually good news for Angel Tavares, I thought, because Ian's now talking about all registered voters in the poll, which was a different part of that yeah. Brown poll. Mm -hmm. That actually only was 31 percent Democrats, and Rhode Island's de uh, registered voters are 40 percent Democrats. So you had fewer Democrats being polled, and yet Angel Tavares came out on top. That suggests he could have some play with independents. Yes, so, they think he can. My, my understanding of how, please correct me if I'm wrong, Brown University did this poll, is they did a general election poll and correct. then they extracted uh, information to use in a primary right. matchup. That is correct. Uh, what do you think about that method, and Joe? Have you ever done it? Would we you ever we do have it? never done that for Channel 12 in the 29 years I've been polling for Channel 12. We do a primary poll, we do a general election poll, we don't intertwine them because the makeup in a Democratic primary is different from a general uh, survey. For example, in the Democratic primary, you've got heavier turnouts in Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls. Those are areas that vote heavier in the Democratic primary, where Cranston doesn't vote as heavy in the Democratic primary. But in the general election, there are a lot more voters than a place so like the Pawtucket. the parts of the region, that, right. the parts of the state, they're not exactly. equal across the exactly. different types well, of elections. And also the makeup is like two-thirds two Democrats, one-third or 36 percent independents. You know, so the makeup is different than the general election survey. Um, I find though, I do not do those together for public consumption. Are we going to see a higher turnout in Providence because uh, the the mayor is running? In, I on think the there's ticket? no question. Providence will turn out very strongly in the Democratic primary. One because the mayor is running, and two because there's going to be a mayoral primary going on. All so right. the voters yeah. will be getting out in the city of Providence. So that turnout will come up high. If remember the last time we were on the air, Scott McKay mentioned like a third of the Democratic primary voters come from Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls. Those are areas that Andrew Tavares will do very, very well in. 
Just to piggyback on something that Joe said, I think history offers some instructive examples of the difference between a primary and a general election. We saw how Merth York yes. could always win a Democratic primary. She could yep. never win a statewide election for governor. And here we kind of have a reverse situation where Raimondo is perceived as a terrific general election mm -hmm. candidate. Her bigger challenge is in a Democratic you primary. Know, and, and you bring that up. There was a kind of a weird question in the poll. They asked about a general election between Raimondo, Tavares, right. Fung, and Block, and that implies that one of the Democrats are going to leave uh, the party. Now, this is something, and so the implication here is it might be uh, the general treasurer, and Raimondo's people have batted this down, but yet it keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Ted, is there a case for why she would do that? You know, I've, I've been someone pushing back at this idea. It's been floating around around politics the whole time uh, since she became prominent in 2011, and I've thought, Gina Raimondo has a national profile that's growing. Why would she want to leave the only party that could get her onto a presidential ticket someday way down the road? But I will say, the more evidence that we see, I mean, that Tavares poll, again, it was a Tavares Commission poll, but it was by a very respected pollster, gave him a 19-point lead in the Democratic primary. If that, if that is anywhere near accurate, Gina Raimondo may have to sit back with her advisors and say, how much money am I going to have to spend to try and win a Democratic primary that I could still lose? And if she loses that Democratic primary, she's not getting on a White House ticket. She's not on any ticket. So mm. while I still am, can't say I'm hearing from anyone close to Raimondo she's going to do that, I can see see why people at least think it's plausible because if she has all this money and some some real cred with independence as mm -hmm. we're seeing in different polls you know she has a good case to make in the general election but again to leave a political party you close off a lot of options I mean that is a, a wide open field yes. run into the end zone to the general election what do you think but the Joe? thing is it can work Lincoln Chafee has done it in Rhode Island you can't say well an independent can't win in Rhode Island it has just been done three years ago so it didn't really work out for right it, but, it, but is that it a great get example elected. I mean, it got him elected. After he got elected, that was his situation. <laughs> the thing to keep in mind is I would think that Gina would probably do a couple of polls. One, she'll do a general election survey. Another time, she'll do a primary survey. And look at those and see which is the clear path to victory for her. I'm sure she would love to stay as a Democrat. But if she does not see a path to victory as a Democrat, she may say, well, I run in the primary and lose. I'm all done. I run as an independent. I have a chance to win. I could come back and do other things down the road. Ian, do you think Ramondo's people are screaming at the television set right now? <laughs> I don't think so. I think they're, they might be quietly nodding to themselves. Um, you know, I think I agree with Joe. She would love to stay a Democrat, but she's very pragmatic. She wants to win. Uh, never say never to closing off a no. different move. I would think she's probably going to run as a Democrat, mm. but I think you have to look at all the options to see what's the best way to run. Let me we, let me say this too. I mean, Sam Howard, uh, who's a blogger for Rhode Future, the liberal yep. website, yep. had a good piece this week noting all we're really talking about right now is the possible horse race, right. fundraising numbers and polls. And you know, I'll defend the political press corps. A, people are interested in that, and B, it's all we have right now. <laughs> but we don't have declared candidates, which means we have no idea what they're going to tell the voters they're going to do. Right? Correct. You know, we need to know. Does Gina Raimondo have some plan that takes off and, and really goes, you know, the voters go for it. Does right. Angel Tavares come out like Lincoln Chafee against whatever the 38 studios of 2014 is and his right. candidacy lights up? There is so much we don't know and the voters don't even know what they're going to be given. All they know is what they think they know right now about these two people. And that's my point of the soft numbers. These numbers could change drastically between now and November 2014. We don't know what's going to happen as far as the issues. People have not put meat on the candidates yet. Yeah. Such an X factor too, the pension settlement that we're, we don't know yes. enough about right mm -hmm. now. Does Gina Raimondo support it? What is in it? How, where do all the candidates come down? I mean, that I, I, we can't wait to see that because I think that's going to have a big impact next year. But polls like this can assist in fundraising. Can, this, I mean, this, Gina Raimondo's people must be like, oh, hey, I'm look, sure. You know? I'm sure Gina's people are taking a brown poll showing that we're, we're, we're ahead by eight points in the Democratic primary. Angel was touting his poll showing him well ahead. Both are trying to raise money from this. Keep in mind one thing. Frank Caprio had a lot of money three years ago. And everyone thought, well, gee, how can you catch Caprio has all this money? Well, the campaign never caught on with the average voters. He had the money. He had some early poll numbers. But as the campaign developed, he went downhill, not uphill. His message didn't resonate with the voters. We don't know whose message is going to resonate with the voters in 2014. 30 seconds or less. Uh, speaking of Frank Caprio, officially announced this week, it sounds like he's campaigning against for Monday. Ian was there. What did you hear? I was actually not at his announcement, but I agree. I think that is a little bit of a concern for Raimondo that uh, uh, Caprio will be airing criticism of her mm -hmm. as he pursues the treasurer's office. All right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. By the way, you said you've been polling here for 29 years? Yeah. Do you know how old Ted is? 29. <laughs> <laughs> how depressing is that? Oh, God. I was but born under the, the Joe Fleming the sun. That's why. <laughs> Joe Fleming, Ian Donis, Ted Nisio, Tim White. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. <laughs>